Hi, welcome to Doc Talk. As you remember, Doc Talk is the podcast put out by the Knoxville Academy of Medicine, where we talk about health issues affecting all East Tennesseans in plain language. That means no doctor talk. <laughs> it means plain language. I'm so happy to welcome with us today Dr. Scott Calicut, who is a peripheral vascular surgeon with Premier Surgical Group here in Knoxville. Peripheral vascular surgeon, that's like a lot of words. Yeah. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about PAD, PAD, PAD. That's P-A-D. That stands for peripheral arterial disease. Yes. You wanna go on with that? Yes. Explain uh, all of that because it's way above my pay grade. Sure. When, <laughs> when we talk about uh, what I do for a living and I tell my patients, I say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a plumber. I just plumb on people. That's it. That's it. And when we talk about blockages in your blood vessels and things like that, we talk about peripheral arterial disease. And that's essentially what it is. You talk about blockage in your heart. We talk about the buildup of plaque. I'm sure most people have heard that term before. But it is. It's a buildup of blockage in your blood vessels. And it happens over a period of time. It's not like it just happens. It's, it's not there one day and, it, and then it's there the next. It's an accumulation of blockage over a long period of time. And it can create real problems for folks. Interesting that you use the plumber analogy. So, you know, I turn on my spigot, no water. There is a problem somewhere, yes. right? <laughs> yes, there could be a real big problem. More often than not, folks, folks with this kind of problem, they can be either asymptomatic, meaning that it's there, but they don't know anything about it because it's not creating any symptoms. Or it's, it's symptomatic, meaning that when they walk, Typically, they have pain, and they can only walk a certain distance before that pain happens. You know, it's interesting that you said that because um, our body is created so ingeniously that, um, okay, I've got my big toe down there. I need to get blood to my big toe. So it starts from my heart, goes down all these different arteries, down to my big toe. And... Sometimes is it because we don't have symptoms because there's other flow avenues of getting blood down there? Well, in a way, I, I equate this to watering the yard. Okay. And this is what I tell my patients is, is that, you know, if you don't water the yard, the grass isn't going to grow. Or if you don't water the yard, the grass is going to die. And so the, the, uh, the heart is really the spigot at the house. In okay. a way, that's the pump. But the problem is, is if you have some kinks in the hose, then you're not going to water the, the yard at the end of, end of the yard. And so, um, so when we have folks with, with this kind of problem, um, we talk about, well, well they're, they're extremes. Uh, and so when folks have symptoms when they walk, what happens is, is their muscles themselves will cramp because they're demanding blood flow. They demand that blood flow for the muscles to do the work. And so when you're walking, if you don't have any kinks in the hose, it just keeps going and you just keep walking and things are just fine. However, if you do have blockages in the hose, well, that demand keeps going, that muscle keeps going and saying, hey, look, the flow can only be so much because of the blockage. So that muscle keeps saying, hey, look, you know, we need more flow, we need more flow. And you get to a point where the muscle says, hey, look, if you don't give any more blood flow, I'm gonna make you hurt because <laughs> You need to stop walking because this is really not working for me. And so what happens is, is people's, their muscles they cramp, cramp. They cramp. They stop walking and that demand goes down. It comes down to where, what they can supply. And so once it meets the supply, the symptoms go away. They can walk again. If they walk up a hill or an incline, that's much more work, much faster. Symptoms come on much sooner. Again, they stop and rest a minute. Amazingly enough, the symptoms go away. And so that's really sort of the basis of, of symptoms with peripheral arterial disease or blockages in your blood vessels, much like in your heart. People talk about having chest pain or angina when they walk. Same symptom here. The heart's a muscle. Calves, thighs, you know, those are just muscles. Brilliant analogy. My leg's having a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So. Okay, so now how do we... Okay, so my leg's telling me I am not getting enough blood flow to it, so then I have to go and see you. Well, initially you'll really 
talk to your primary care doctor because okay. that's really where it all starts. Okay. Um, you know, there, there are lots of risks for peripheral arterial disease. And so what I call the trifecta, which is the, the, the major things that cause peripheral arterial disease, these are our diabetics, our patients with high blood pressure or hypertension, and our smokers. And so, you know, smoking increases your risk of peripheral arterial disease a hundredfold over anything else. And so the first thing that your primary care doctor is going to work on is getting off those cigarettes. Then they're going to work on keeping that, if you're a diabetic, you know what I'm talking about, that hemoglobin A1C. Keeping that hemoglobin A1C at 6 or whatever the target rate is. And there are a lot of other risk factors, but those, again, those are the things when I think about it, those are the trifecta of what we initially really try to get those patients to control. Hypertension, diabetes, and smoking. Yes. Okay. So once, once they start working on all those risk factors and the patient continues to have symptoms, sometimes they try medications for this, but oftentimes these medications have been around for a long time. But unfortunately, either you can't take the medicines because the side effects are so, so difficult or it's just, it's just not working for you. Sometimes they just don't work and then that's when they come to see me. Okay. All right, so um, symptoms, pain in my legs, I'm controlling my hypertension, I'm controlling my diabetes, and I've cut back to three cigarettes a day. Okay. It used to be two packs, three <laughs> cigarettes a day. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's great. Okay. And so then what do you do for me? Well, initially when I talk to folks, we talk about walking, because really that's what you need to do is walk. Your muscle is going to help, just like in the heart when, if you've ever had anybody with heart problems, they generate their own bypass and, and those kinds of things. If you walk 20 to 30 minutes, three to four times a week, now this is the hard way, you'll notice that your walking distance will get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. You'll peak, but your walking distance will get better. And we have, you know, a certain subset of patients will take that and run with it. And then you got other folks, it's just hard for them to do those kinds of things. It really is. They work, you know, an eight hour a day and it's hard for them to come home or they work a 10 hour a day or it's just hard for them to get around. And so we work with those patients. Then surgically, we look for other options for those patients to improve their, their walking distance because it really is starting to limit their life or their lifestyle. You know, I think that's great that, um, you know, people think, oh, my doctor referred me to go see a surgeon. That means I need surgery, but that's not true. No, not necessarily. We work on both the medical end and then we work on the surgical end or, or basically minimally invasive surgery or open surgery it's in order to help them improve their, their symptoms. Okay. And these are lifelong things that we follow patients. So we're just not, uh, you know, treating the problem or surgically treating the problem and then casting them out on society. These are lifelong problems, and I tell my patients, you and I are going to be fast friends for a long time. So the first thing that the person does, that the patient does, when they come to see you is walk. Yes, we talk about, well, really, what's the treatment plan? Once okay. we've got the diagnosis, um, really, at that point, well, how do you diagnose peripheral arterial disease? Really, it's, it's based on the symptoms, and then based on your symptoms of, of your walking distance. Now, if you're out walking a mile a day and you're having calf cramping at a mile, you know, those are the folks we're gonna treat conservatively. Okay. And when I say conservative, we talk about that walking and exercise program and really working with our primary care doctor to make sure that we manage their risk factors, meaning getting off the cigarettes, making sure their cholesterol's in tow, making sure that blood pressure and those, that, that diabetes is being managed. Then we have the folks that really can't walk more than one or two blocks without having to stop and how that impacts their life. And they're not really able to have much of a quality of life. When you can't walk from the parking lot to the door at the grocery store without having to stop, then it really gets, I mean, it's, Well, it's then you can't exercise. You and then if you exercise. can't exercise, then you start doing that's one of these things. That's exactly right. When you can't exercise, it's hard for you to, be, to control your blood sugar. Right. It just becomes very difficult. Right. So. Those are the folks that then we talk talking about options to treat their problems either with minimally invasive surgery or what we call endovascular, it's a complicated, or 
whether it's open surgery with a bypass or something like that. Okay, yeah. time out. That's like big talk. <laughs> sure, no problem. Okay, yeah. so um, surgery. Yes. Minimally invasive surgery. Minimally invasive surgery, and I'm, I'm sure most folks have heard about ballooning and stenting in the yes. heart and those kinds of things. These are some of the techniques that we can do to open up blockages in the legs and in a variety of other places. And so, and it's often done through just a little needle stick and you can have it done and go home the same day. So I tell folks, you know, this isn't, because this is a very complicated problem, it sounds relatively easy. And I said, listen, this isn't Burger King surgery. You know, this isn't have it your way drive through. These are real problems that need to be addressed. And even though that, it, just like with the heart, even though it's done with a balloon or a stent, it still doesn't, mean that it's not serious. It's very serious. Very serious problems. And so, and that's why we follow these patients long term. But needless to say, you know, hopefully in some certain instances, you know, like I said, we can treat these problems with minimally invasive or, you know, little needle sticks and ballooning and stenting open so that we can improve their quality of life so that they can walk further distances before they have symptoms. Okay, so endovascular. Yes. Um, endo meaning inside. Yes. Vascular meaning blood vessel. Correct. So you make a little hole, you get inside my artery, and you you navigate this, you better tell it. Yep. <laughs> Think of it like, like I said, I'm a plumber. Think about it like the rooter rooter man. Mm -hmm. He goes on the inside of your pipes and in his particular case, he goes in there and unclogs it in a way. And in some certain instances, we can get in there and kind of unclog it. But think about it, uh, I guess I, I tell my patients, think about it like a tube that's built up with hard Crisco or hard, hard mustard. And so what I do is I go in there and think of it like a tube or a pipe. I'll thread, an, uh, essentially thread the needle or pass the narrowing. And then I'll go in there and balloon open the blood vessel. So when you balloon it open, so you're just inflating a balloon in that blockage to crush that blockage against the wall. That's all balloon angioplasty is, just like in the heart, they balloon open blockage. That's all that is. And then we put a stent in there to tack down the blockage and keep everything nice and smooth. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's just thinking about like the rotor rooter man. Right, and so, you know, not all plaque is all plaque. There's all different kinds of plaque. There's all different kinds of plaque. It, it could be soft plaque, hard plaque. Like I said, we're being very simplistic here. Like I said, to get very complicated, but if, if you're thinking about what your doctor is getting ready to do in, in terms of opening up blockage, whether it be in your legs or another place, then that's exactly what he's gonna do. If he's gonna balloon it open or balloon angioplasty it, then he's gonna put a stent in there to tack it all down and make it nice and smooth and open, okay? One of the, um, yeah, thank you. One of the dangers when we try to make it simple and understandable is then not really understanding how risky and complicated it can be. I mean, if you're putting a wire in a blood vessel, I know I've seen lots of different blood vessels and some of them, the wire can go in the wrong direction and perforate and then mm -hmm. put a big hole in your artery. So that's a danger. And then I know sometimes the plaque is hard or soft. And then when you go and you try to crack it, little bits and pieces fall apart and then they go travel down mm -hmm. and it's like, can't catch it. <laughs> I mean, right. it's very, very risky. It is, it is, it, it carries risk. And so when you talk about blockages in your blood vessels, you talk about, well, what's the risk of losing my leg? Right. Because right. that's what we're talking about here. And, and is that in someone who walks and their, their, their calves cramp and it limits their ability to do what they want to do, or they have a, you know, significant blockages in their, in their legs. Well, really what we're trying to do is prevent you from losing a toe or a foot. Right. So limb loss. And so well, what's my risk of limb loss with I'm, when I'm just walking and cramping really bad? Well, my risk of limb loss is somewhere between 1% and 3%. So, albeit very low, you have a risk of losing your leg. Now, again, things get 
much more complicated when the blockage gets more and more and that pain gets worse and worse to a point where you can't even go to sleep at night with having pain. Or you have a bad looking toe that's looking kind of black and dead. Or ulcers. Or wounds, exactly. So that risk of losing your leg goes dramatically up. And so you better be getting into your vascular surgeon's office if you're having those kinds of problems. Yeah, or your primary, office, primary care doctor's office. You know, I know in, in my field that falling and that age group, falling is probably the number two problem mm -hmm. that impacts them. And if you have pain in your leg, if you have cramping in your leg, if you have wounds, open wounds, it's going to be hard. You're going to be scared. You're going to be a little bit more tentative on walking. You're going to fall. Yes. And then you're going to break a hip. That's not good. No. All preventable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I often tell my patients, we need, uh, they would come in and, and they, they had had a fall or something like that. I said, we just need to wrap you in some bubble wrap. So you just bounce right oh. back up. <laughs> but, uh, but when you talk about patients and, and falling and, and, and that sort of thing, weakness in your legs doesn't necessarily translate to peripheral arterial disease. And the reason why is, is that we're talking about what your complaints are, what you're complaining of you also put together what you find when you examine the patient. If you don't have pulses in your feet, you don't have pulses in your groins, you know, those are all indications that you've got some blockage or some limitation of flow. And the question is, is where are you on the spectrum of blockage? Is it mild, is it moderate, or is it severe? And so that's how we can gauge what the patient's telling us or what you're telling us as to correlating it with what we find physically on you and then determining and putting it together with the story as to whether this is causing the problem. This is causing their, their weakness in their legs and they, they're about to fall down. Or is it that you know, they've got some bad spine problems and, and, and nerve problems? So is a, um, is a Doppler, a, is a, do you find that the results from a Doppler are correlate, have a high degree of correlation with their symptoms? Y yes. Okay. What we do is, is so we'll, once we move from the history of getting the information and then examining and kind of figuring out where the pulses are and the problems, then the next step is, again, finding, you, finding where you're at on the spectrum. With, so we, and we get an ultrasound. And what the ultrasound looks at is really the flow down your legs. We also will actually measure the blood pressure in your ankles and compare it to the blood pressure in your arms because they should be the same. You know, heart's pumping to the same spot. But what we find is, is that in people with blockage, the blood pressure in the arm is normal. People, people do have blockages in their arms, but not very commonly per se. It's, so it should be normal. So we compare that blood pressure to the ankle and oftentimes you may be getting 50% of your normal flow to your, ankle, or you, to your ankles as compared to your arm. So there's a problem in between. You're losing 50% of your flow from blockage. Those are the patients who can't walk more than a couple of blocks without having to stop or, you know, other kinds of problems like we talked about, wounds, ulcers, those kinds of things. Let's say for one reason or another, um, low back pain. They're not able to walk. Um, are there other exercises they can do even, I mean, that's just not a good enough excuse to say, well, you just, yeah. Right. Um, frankly, I tell people anything that they can do, uh, people have an exercise bike, um, any kind of exercise. The other thing with people that I tell folks who have back problems and a lot of people don't have this luxury, but if you have, or could belong to a gym with a pool or if there's a community pool, more often than not in, in our elderly population, there's a, com a community center, a community center with a pool. And so those folks can oftentimes put on float belts and there's zero gravity. So you can get in and exercise. Excellent. And it do puts, doesn't put as much pressure on your back as anything else. It's great for your heart, it's great for your legs, and so that helps. All right. Um, not a final question, but I was just thinking, sure. okay, so if I, we've been talking mostly about blood flow down to my toes. Um, how does PAD affect blood flow 
elsewhere? Well, you can have blockage in a, in a variety of places. You can have blockages more, more commonly in the left arm than the right arm, but you can have blockages in your neck blood vessels, in your carotid arteries, which could increase your risk of stroke. Um, to your arms, wasn't, doesn't necessarily uh, increase your risk of losing an extremity as you would think in your legs because your body has ways of compensating, but as sure as the world can make it difficult for you to paint your room. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or, or play ball with your son. Exactly right. Or reach up on a shelf. Or, or your daughter. Sorry. Or, or my classic question is, does your arm really get tired when you wash your hair? Ah. And so if you're washing your hair and your left arm, just gosh, it just kind of gets tired and you have to dangle it down. Just like in your legs. It was doing work. And so you, and your blood pressure in this arm, again, like we talked about with blood pressure, the blood pressure in this arm may not be as high as the blood pressure over here. Well, you may have some blockage there, and that may or may not need to be addressed. How often does blockage in the legs maybe be a harbinger or a sign that there's blockage elsewhere? Oh, wow. Um, you know, peripheral arterial disease or the presence of peripheral arterial disease increases your risk, and unfortunately, it's a very morbid thing, is it does increase your risk of heart attacks. Right. And just the presence of that diagnosis uh, does increase your risk of heart attack and maybe even uh, death over the, the average person just because of that diagnosis. And so, again, those are things that when it's present, uh, you need to make sure that it's being managed or you're managing your risk factors, okay? Manager managing risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, and smoking. Yes. Which, cholesterol. And cholesterol, yes. Um, it's interesting, you know, cholesterol is really, management of cholesterol over the past 20 years has really evolved. Yeah. And so these medications that we're on, the statin drugs, which are very important, everybody thinks that, well, it's great, it is great for your cholesterol, but those statin drugs really do have a positive effect on your blood vessels as well. And so just stay, whether it be stabilizing blockage, and again, we're really getting into the weeds here, but those, those statin drugs, they stabilize plaque. They provide a, a variety of benefits for blockages in your neck blood vessels. And so if it's something that you need based on your evaluation by your primary care doctor or the evidence of peripheral arterial disease, statin drugs are things that we do put our patients on. It's amazing. I mean, I just watch all the different guidelines and theory and research that goes on and comes out in 30 years and how we manage. We've come so far, but we still have so much to do. now. There's questions I'm sure people have about peripheral arterial disease that, sure. that we haven't touched upon. If they have questions, how do they get a hold of you? They can go to our website, uh, www.premiersurgical.com, uh, to get in touch with me, or you can call our office, 865-588-8229, or you can go to the, uh, really the SVS, which is the Vascular Surgical Society, or www.vascularweb.org. And they've got a variety of information on peripheral arterial disease as well as a, a lot of other vascular problems. I'll just put Scott Tad Knoxville. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> That'll pull you up, right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, Dr. Scott Calicut, thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for enjoying and joining us today. And that's a wrap.